Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Anybody glad to be here this morning? Thank you, Lord. Well, do me a favor. Cross the aisle. Introduce yourself to someone you know well, somebody you maybe don't know so well, and welcome them. Give them a hearty chag sameach, hag shavuot sameach, hug and handshake. We have an intimate group this morning. Many of our people are at the conference, and many will be leaving shortly for the conference at Faith Chapel. It's a free conference. It's a One New Man conference. Many of our people have been putting it on and volunteering, but we are here on God's appointed time. Amen. Well, you may be seated for a few minutes. Let's talk about the appointed time we're here for today as we open up this Shabbat service focused on the festival of Shavuot, which actually begins this evening. Many of us have learned by experience that often sequels, whether it's a movie sequel or something else, are almost is never as good as the original, except for Top Gun, which my wife and I saw this weekend, past weekend, which was, but, well, it just so happens we have a sequel more like a rerun, actually, with some significant changes and enhancements in the Word of God that is just as powerful as the original, dare I say, even more powerful. And I believe that's exactly how Adonai wanted us to view this holiday of Shavuot, in a sense, as a prequel, part one, to be continued. And now part two of this festival came nearly 1,550 years later, and not too many people even remember that it even had a part two, except for a few like Kepha or Peter in Acts chapter two. And part two in many respects mirrored part one. You know, Shavuot is a gratitude tradition among the Jewish people for the gift of Torah, for the gift of the harvest. And for us as Messianics, the gift of the Ruach, the spirit, and for the building up of community. It's true that many of our people, the Jewish people, many non-Jews as well, don't even observe this festival. But that, does that make it a good idea to not undertake this inconvenience, as it were, of gratitude? Of course not. Go with me in the Word of God to Devarim, Deuteronomy chapter 16. And let's begin reading uh, in verse 9 this morning. Seven weeks you are to count for yourself. And we have. From the time you begin to put the sickle to the standing grain, you will begin to count seven weeks. And then you will keep the feast of Shavuot to Adonai your God with a measure of a freewill offering from your hand, which you are to give according to how Adonai your God blesses you. So you will rejoice before Adonai your God in the place Adonai your God chooses to make his name dwell. You and your son and daughter, slave and maid, Levite and outsider, orphan and widow in your midst. So those of us who are Hebrew speakers here, even at the most limited degree, we understand that Shavuot is the plural, right, of the Hebrew word Sheva, which means seven. It's from that root that we have the English word Sabbath. And so the meaning of the name of this holiday is weeks. And the timing, as we've just read here, biblically is to be calculated by calculating se counting seven weeks plus one day, commencing on the day after the Passover Sabbath. And this is where the Greek term for 50 days, Pentecost, came into usage. And so Pentecost and Shavuot count from the Passover, and they are the same exact holiday. So it has many names. If you're taking a few notes here, just want to go over a few names, and then we're going to move to a different section of our service. It's known as Chag Habikurim, the harvest festival of the first fruits. You see, in ancient days, Shavuot was primarily an agricultural feast. And the laws and the ceremonies of this festival are among the most beautiful, if you can read them, Deuteronomy 26 and in other places, and the most meaningful and beautiful in all the Torah. You see, any Jewish person who lived back in the days of the temple 
who owned any sort of fruit trees would take a portion, would take any amount of the first fruits produced from those trees, tie it in a bundle, and begin and to bring it as an offering to the temple there in Jerusalem. And the day that this ceremony began was on Shavuot. And the Mishnah in Tractate Bikurim describes this ceremony, describes the masses who were gathered outside of Jerusalem on this day, began to march toward the city with their fruits carried in their baskets. Before them was an ox, its horns overlaid with gold. A flute was played while the rulers and the dignitaries of Jerusalem went out to greet them. And then came the beautiful pageantry of the temple service with the Levites would break forth in songs while the farmers carried their baskets into the temple, placing them next to the altar, reciting prayers of thanksgiving. First fruits of the wheat harvest were then brought before God in the temple. Again, first fruits of that portion of the crop or produce which is set apart for the Lord for his use only. And so giving of first fruits honored the Lord. He recognized God as our provider. And so when the Israelites had returned that amount back to the Lord, God graciously returned the rest of the land's produce back for their sustenance. You see, their purpose in giving first fruits to God was therefore to show what? To show his ownership over the land and their reliance on God to provide the remainder of the harvest through their labor. Now we know that the Feast of Israel were all harvest festivals and were times for the people to gather together into the Lord and to celebrate His provision. And so these harvest festivals are used, my friends, as reminders of the transitions which God wishes to bring all of us through. Why? So that our spiritual pilgrimage will bear the fruit that He has already planted deep in our lives. So if Passover is considered the birth of the nation of Israel, what's Shavuot? Well, Shavuot could be its bar or bat mitzvah. The time when ad adolescents come of age, the time when adolescents are considered old enough, adult enough to be responsible for their moral duties and their spiritual duties as expressed in the Torah. And likewise, we can liken Shavuot to a spiritual adolescence as well, where God takes what he's redeemed at Passover changes it, giving us focus, giving us purpose. My friends, through all of God's festivals, he allowed Israel to function as a prophetic vehicle to lead all mankind to his glorious Messiah, Yeshua. I believe the festivals do the same thing in our generation. They will lead honest. You've got to be an honest seeker. If you are honest, it'll lead you to the Messiah. Number two, it's known as Atzeret Shel Pesach, the completion of Passover, as I mentioned. Passover, 50 days ago, right, brought us freedom out of Egypt. But freedom without laws, what's that? It's chaos, right? It's anarchy. No legal restraints on murder, robbery. How could we travel without traffic laws, etc.? And so God gave Israel the Torah, which just means instruction, by the way, at Mount Sinai, not to take back her freedom, but to preserve it, to provide direction for our people. And finally, it's known, this festival is known as Zman Rabban, not Matan, rather, Zman Matan Torah Tenu, the time of the giving of our Torah. According to unanimous Jewish tradition, which was received during the days of Yeshua, the Sinaitic Theophany, the giving of the Torah, was given at Mount Sinai, 50 days after our people left Egypt. Now, I don't think really we can make any exact assumption with regarding to the exact date of the giving of the Ten Commandments or the rest of the Torah. The scripture is actually not that precise. Exodus 19.1 tells us it was in the third month, but not in such a way as to indicate which day on the third month. But even the later verses describe the number of days of preparation, before Moses went to receive the Torah, are not given by specific dates. And so it seems to me we can't determine the exact day of the giving of the Torah. But in any event, we're to accept this wonderful gift of Torah that God gave us at this season. In Jewish tradition, Shavuot's compared to a wedding. For it was on Shavuot that the 
The covenant between God and the Jewish people was then sealed at Mount Sinai. A colleague and I were speaking several years back, many years back now, and he was sharing with me that when in his synagogue, when the Sefer Torah comes out of the ark, it's analogous to when Adonai handed the Torah to Moses at Mount Sinai. And so when we process the Torah scroll through the synagogue, it is our opportunity to reach out, to take hold of it like our Jewish people did nearly 3,300 years ago. And once again, we say like they did back then to our God, Naaseh v'nishma, everything that you have said, O oh God, we will do and we will obey. In other words, what are we doing every single week and on this day of Shabbat, uh, Shavuot as well? Is in a sense we are reenacting the events of Mount Sinai and renewing our vows to God, especially on this day of Shavuot. And I believe this part of our service every week can be also viewed as a perfect reenactment as well of the incarnation of the Messiah. It says in Yochanan chapter 1, quote, that what? The word became flesh and dwelt among us. You see, Yeshua is not just the Messiah. He's also the living Torah. He is the embodiment of Torah, isn't he? And so when we open up the ark and we bring the Torah scroll down from the bima into the congregation, that in a sense can be likened to the incarnation. As we process it through the synagogue, everyone has an opportunity to draw near. Like that woman we read about in the Gospels who had the issue of blood for 12 years, who reached out her hand to just grab the hold, a hold of the hem of, of the garment of Yeshua. A friend of Tree of Life emailed me on this matter and said this, quote, Every time the ark is open to reveal the Torah scroll, I feel and I see the fire of God and the mighty wind blows out and overwhelms me. And so every Shabbat, and on this day of Shavuot too, each one of us today has this opportunity to reach out, to take hold of the word, or on the other hand, turn our backs on it. The choice is ours today. I encourage you this morning to touch the scroll, the Etz Chaim, the tree of life. Craig, if you come up, And if we would stand for the Shema this morning. And let's begin by opening up the ark with these words. Vayhi bin soha Aaron, vayomer Moshe, kuma Adonai, ve'afutsu hohivecha. Vihanusu mi sanecha mi panecha ki mi tzion teitzei Torah ki mi tzion teitzei Torah. Udvar Adonai me Yerushalayim Baruch Shenatan Torah Torah Baruch Shenatan Torah Torah Le Amo Yisrael, Behik Du Hu
place in you today, Lord. Father, we recite back to you your word today. From Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 and forward, let's recite it back to him right now. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Boruch Shem Kivod Mahalchuto Leola Vahed. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be the name of his glorious kingdom, which is forever. And ever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Open up your scriptures this morning to Exodus chapter 19 for the reading on this day. We begin in verse 1. In the third month after B'nai Yisrael had gone out of the land of Egypt. That same day they arrived at the wilderness of Sinai. They traveled from Rephidim, came into the wilderness of Sinai, and set up camp in the wilderness. Israel camped there, right in front of the mountain. Moses went up to God, verse 3, and Adonai called to him from the mountain, saying, Say this to the house of Jacob, and tell B'nai Israel, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you listen closely to my voice and keep my brit, my covenant, Then you will be my own segula, my own treasure from among all people, for all the earth is mine. So as for you, you will be to me a kingdom of kohanim, of priests, and a holy nation. These are the words which you are to speak to the children of Israel. Verse 10 goes on to say, Adonai said to Moses, go to the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow. Let them wash their clothing. Be ready for the third day. For on the third day, Adonai will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Verse 16. And in the morning of the third day, there was thundering and lightning, a thick cloud on the mountain, and the blast of an exceedingly loud shofar. And all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. And they stood at the lowest part of the mountain. Verse 18. Now the entire Mount Sinai was in smoke because Adonai had descended upon it in fire. The smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace. The whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the sound of the shofar grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him, with a thunderous sound. Then Adonai came down onto Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain. Adonai called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses went up. And so God here is making a marriage betrothal contract. It's a ketubah with Israel, understood to be the Torah that spelled out mutual obligations, both of the Lord and Israel. And here Israel accepts God's marriage proposal in verse 8. I'm going to ask us to stand as we read the Ten Commandments this morning, chapter 20. 
Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am Adonai, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. Do not make for yourself a graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven, above or on the earth below or in the water under the earth. Do not bow to them. Do not let anyone make you serve them. For I, Adonai, your God, am a jealous God, bringing the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to the thousands of generations of those who love me and keep my mitzvot. You must not take the name of Adonai your God in vain, for Adonai will not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. Remember Yom Shabbat to keep it holy. You are to work six days and do all of your work, but the seventh day is a Shabbat to Adonai your God. In it you shall not do any work, not you nor your son, your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, your cattle, nor the outsider that is within your gates. For in six days Adonai made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Thus Adonai blessed Yom Shabbat and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long upon the land which Adonai your God has given you. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness against your neighbor. Do not covet your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife, his manservant, his maidservant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Let's go before the Lord in that spirit of awe and reverence this morning as we worship him and as we praise him.
Take us out of the comfort places. Strip us of everything we're dependent on, God. Let us only depend on you. Let us only depend on you. We want nothing more.
they oppressed the Egyptians, the more they increased. We receive these words from you today, Lord God. We thank you that greater is he that's within us than he that's within this world. We thank you for the trials, the tribulations, and the challenges over these past 49 days that we have been counting the days up to Shavuot. Lord, you've been changing us. You've been challenging us. You've been transforming us. Lord, you've been doing the work of conviction in us as well, Lord been a time of introspection. We thank you, Lord. It's all been leading to this day biblically on your calendar where we've looked at the first Shavuot. And Father, we are looking to one right now and we're looking forward to that day, Lord God, when we see the things that are written about in the book of Acts that Joel prophesied come to pass in a greater measure in our day. So thank you, Lord, for these times and seasons, Lord, where we can stop, we can worship, we can praise, we can contemplate you in the earth. Thank you, Lord, that all Israel shall be saved. We don't understand that. We can't comprehend it, but your word says it. So we believe your word in every man a liar. Hashem Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hey, before we, before we get seated, I want to have our worship team gather around here in the center. They need to head off to the conference right now, and we want to just lift them up in prayer. The same spirit that hovers over them today would hover over them at Faith Chapel for the rest of the day at this conference, as they'll be ministering as well, and our dancers, too, are heading over there, and we know a number of folks are already over there serving and volunteering. This is a citywide effort, folks. This is born... Uh, really, I believe the vision of Messianic Judaism to bring both Jew and Gentile together. Uh, we pray, we thank you for Earl, we thank you for John, oh God, who have put months and months into preparing for this day, for this conference. Lord, we know it's going on even now. We ask you, Lord, if there are any at this conference that do not believe yet that they would come into the kingdom of God today, filled with the Spirit of God in their lives, would leave transformed and whole in Yeshua's name. So, Lord, now we lift up our worship team to you as they minister on the platform, Lord, to an audience of one over at Faith Chapel. Yeah. We thank you, Lord, that a spirit of shalom would go forth in dunamis, in power today on this eve of Shavuot. Go forward, minister to and through them today. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Go forth. Go forth. Go forth. And for those who remain, you may be seated. My friends, some, oh, and for the tech team, we want to lift up Joe as well. Joe's going over there interfacing on a tech board. He's never been around before. Lord bless his socks off. Give him clarity to let everything sound the way it needs to sound. In Yeshua's name. 
And Lord, we lift up Victor, who's serving hundreds of free meals right now as well, Lord, in the next hour or so, and all that are working at this conference to make it a blessing to our city. Well, my friends, some give offerings to ministries uh, because they feel like it. Others give offerings to ministries for good projects, and both of those are great reasons, of course, but there's even a higher motivation, I believe, for our giving, and it's because we are giving based on covenant found in the Word of God. Go with me in the Torah to the closing chapters of the Torah where we find, we look ahead to the future of Israel. The children of Israel are about to cross the Jordan into the land of promise, our Kindergarten kids and up can go out with Miss Kat and Miss Vicky to the children's room. Thanks for bringing your kids. We're kind of revamping our Shabbat school over the summer. And so Moses describes this ceremony as we're about to cross the Jordan into the land of promise that they're to follow when they harvest the first crops in the new land. And so they're to bring an offering of the first fruits to the priest and I recount the story of their deliverance out of Egypt. We don't have time, of course, to look at this entire ceremony, but here are the highlights. Deuteronomy 26, let's look at verse 1. Now, when you enter the land that Adonai your God is giving you as an inheritance, and you possess it and dwell in it, you are to take some of the first of all the produce of the soil, which you gather from your land that Adonai your God is giving you, put it in a basket, go to the place Adonai your God chooses to make his name dwell. Verse 4. The Kohen, the priest, is to take the basket from your hand and set it down before the altar of Adonai, your God. And so he, these were the laws and these were the ceremonies for Shavuot, bringing the first fruits to the priest. This is actually a special offering of first fruits. From the first of the harvest they gained in the promised land is contrasted with the first fruits that were regularly brought to the priests uh, in Numbers chapter 18, for example. Look with me. The ceremony goes on, verse 9, we're to say something. We're to say, verse 9, he brought us to this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So now look, I have brought the first of the fruits of the soil that you have given me, Lord. Then you are to set it down before the Lord your God and worship before the Lord your God. And so these are the words of praise. These are the words of thanks at the giving of first fruits. This was an important way to say, Todar Rabbah, thanks so much, God. And so giving, of course, with the right heart was expected. That's the proper way to worship. Finally, verse 11, you will rejoice in all the good that Adonai your God has given to you and to your house, you, the Levite, and the outsider in your midst. And so we're to do this not in a spirit of, oh, I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills. No, we're to rejoice. Giving causes us to rejoice. And so that's the proper response to our creator today who has supplied us with all good things. Thank you those who are logging on on our Facebook live stream or watching us archived on our YouTube page. Thank you for continuing to give electronically. Thank you for sending in checks to our P.O. Box. Thank you for giving here in person. Let's go before God in our giving today. Vinu Malkenu, our Father and our King, we thank you for this beautiful ceremony found in Torah on this Shavuot. And Lord, maybe next year we'll actually get some baskets and reenact this ceremony, Lord, as we think about it. But it's a blessing, Lord, to give back to you, knowing, Lord, that you desire to bless us 30, 60, and 100 fold, that we might continue the cycle of blessing the nations, blessing our people here in San Diego, blessing the rest of the community. We thank you ahead of time for your provision and for the ceremony and scriptures. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Listen, if there's anybody here for the first time, thanks, Ferris. Raise your hand. Ferris and Jeff will put a free book into your hands, The Fig Tree Blossoms. It'll give you an understanding of why we do what we do here. Uh, and our mission and our vision statement. And while they're doing that, I want to play for the final time the conference video. If you've not made up your mind uh, to go after this service over to Faith Chapel, 9400 Campo Road in Spring Valley, I want to encourage you for the last time, don't miss the second half of this conference. Guys, we can play that final time. <laughs> We need to cooperate with one another. It's two sides of the same base on which all the prophets and the apostles rest. We've got to get out of competition mode and begin, this is a good start, to work together. I am astounded at the depth of wounding of people 
from their childhood by their fathers. And the way it works itself out is wherever they are, they're still looking for that someone to fill that gap. And until they can get to the heavenly father to, to address that wounding, they're going to always be searching. As Jews began to return to Israel, we began to go back to the original pattern, honoring the fathers of our faith. Daniel was Jewish. The tribulation has to start in the first year of a Shemitah cycle. The Bible only talks about two categories of people, Jewish and Gentile. So Paul says, he's our peace who broke down the barrier, the dividing wall between the two groups so that in himself, he might make the two into one new humanity, thus establishing peace. One new man and Abba Father. That's what's happening over at uh, Faith Chapel right now. We'll be happening until 4.30 today. I encourage you after the service, after some time of nosh and refreshments to head on out there and we'll see you back there as well. Go with me in, the, in your scriptures to the book of Acts this morning. We took a look at part one. I want to take a look at part two for the rest of our time together. Sinai and Acts chapter two. Theological, deep theological parallels between two events separated between time. I want to clear up some misconceptions with you this morning in the body of the Messiah. Draw some parallels between what we've spoken about, the functions of the Torah given at Sinai, possibly on this very day of Shavuot, and the function of the infilling Ruach, the Spirit, given on another festival of Shavuot nearly 1,550 years later, and attempt somehow to correlate these two separated events to show you how they fit together, hand in glove. Well, we know that Adonai spoke through the prophet Jeremiah of a time in the future when he would write his Torah not only on stone tablets, right, but what? On our hearts, Jeremiah 31. And likewise, the prophet Ezekiel mentions Adonai placing his spirit inside of us in that same connection, causing us to live by his laws, to live by his teachings, Ezekiel 36. And so, my friends, what more appropriate time to visibly do that, to place God's spirit in his people so that we might live by his laws, live by his teachings, then on Shavuot, the feast associated with his Torah. Folks, it makes perfect sense to me that the day of Shavuot spoken here in the book of Acts chapter 2 was something of a reenactment, something of a completion of the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai 1,500 plus years earlier. What am I saying? I'm saying, in other words, we find, in a sense, history being stretched from the fire at Mount Sinai that we read earlier to the, what we're going to read now, the tongues of fire in Jerusalem. But I don't want you to misunderstand me this morning, and we've talked about it in our prior series here. The new covenant, the Brit Chadashah, is not like the Sinai covenant. No, the new covenant is not some sort of renewed vow to keep the law, according to Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. No, the definition we find in that passage, and likewise in the Ezekiel passage, chapter 36, is different. It's a motivation from the inside. It is Torah placed in the heart, not a renewal of a commitment to the Sinai covenant. This Torah placed in our hearts certainly does include expressional fulfillment like we find here in a messianic synagogue. But it is not to be viewed as legalistic. Although many folks get that impression. They walk in here and they think what we're doing is legalistic. No. We're not here teaching at Tree of Life a list of laws. We're catching a vision of Torah placed in our hearts. What do I mean by that? I'm going to have you write this down because this is something, if you get nothing out of this message, write this down. I heard this catchphrase years ago, and it really makes sense to me. And it is this. The Spirit of God, without the Torah of God, is contentless. While the Torah of God, without the Spirit of God, is powerless. Let me repeat that. The Spirit of God without the Torah of God is contentless. 
while the Torah without the Spirit is powerless. You see, the Spirit empowers us to live out the Torah, imperfectly, of course. And the Torah is the specific content in which the Spirit is leading us to walk. Now, we're not speaking about Torah in terms of being lived out for our salvation. More parallels between Sinai and Acts chapter 2. Moses, as you recall, comes down from the mountain, speaks to the people of God's Ten Commandments, as we read earlier. And notice this. We didn't read this in chapter 20 in verse 18. We stopped here. It says, All the people witnessed the thundering and the lightning and the sound of the shofar and the mountain smoking. When the people saw it, they trembled and stood far off. So this verse speaks about the thundering and the lightning at Sinai. Literally, though, in the Hebrew, and some of your Bibles may put this as a footnote or a translator's note, translated in the Hebrew literally, voices and torches. Voices and torches. And the Hebrew literally says, V'chol ha'am ro'im et hakolot. They saw the voices. It was a wonder, wasn't it, for the people gathered there that day? So keep that on the shelf for a moment in your brain. Now let's fast forward 1,550 years later to another Shavuot ceremony that describes tongues like fire in terms akin to what we just read, the thunder and lightning flashes and the voices that people saw at Mount Sinai. Pick it up in Acts, the second chapter. Read with me in verse 1. When the day of Shavuot had come, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And tongues like fire spreading out appeared to them and settled on each one of them. And only 10% were filled with the Ruach Kodesh. <laughs> they were all filled with Ruach Kodesh. And began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them to speak out. My friends, the roar and the fire here in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2 recalled back 1,500 years earlier to the fire and the smoke and the sounds at Sinai that we just read. However, one thing different. Instead of God's people being kept away like at Sinai, God's glory, His kavod, represented by Tongues like fire came to each person. So in a sense, Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God on Mount Zion in Jerusalem repeats the phenomenon at Mount Sinai, 269 miles away, 1,550 years spread out in time later for the people, the Jewish people throughout the known world. It was in a sense somewhat of a second giving of the Torah of God, as it were, was given by the Spirit of God this time. But this time it was written as, if you're like me in the 80s when those Apple II computers came out, it is now came to us as RAM. It was written on the hearts of men, not as hard copy on tablets of stone. You see, it was always God's intention, my friends, to bring the Jewish new covenant to the Jewish people in a Jewish way. And so God's making use of the maximum use of his moedim, of his appointed times, to convey new truths in ways that emphasize their connection with old truths. And so in this way, Shavuot was a fulfillment of the promise of first fruits, sealing the promise of the Passover at the Exodus with the giving of the Torah and pointing to the sealing of the promise of the Messiah's resurrection with the giving here of the Spirit. So my friends, the early Jewish believers really understood this connection as significant to their practice, as significant to their theology. And it gets missed. It's going to get missed in thousands of churches tomorrow as they gather for Pentecost Sunday. And so Acts chapter 2 tells us that the 120, verse 2, 15 of the prior chapter says there was 120, that's key, 120 Galilean disciples were gathered together in an upper room in a house. It was actually one of the many chambers in the temple called Solomon's Colonnade, Solomon's Porch. 
There were benches there. There were seats that accommodated the worshipers in the rows of columns across from the court of the Gentiles and around the court of the women. And Jewish men would then assemble in the court of Israel while their women met in the court of the women. And therefore, the 120 Talmudim, the disciples, were all together in one place in the house, the temple, the Beit HaMikdash, the holy house. Now, it's interesting, likewise, making connections here between part one and part two, that there were 120 priests, by the way, playing the trumpets at the first dedication of the temple in the days of Solomon. You remember that day when the outpouring of the Spirit of God was so powerful, the priests could not even continue their service. It was so powerful. Second Chronicles chapter five details it for us. And the prophet Haggai wrote, quote, Who among you is left that saw this house in its former glory? Speaking of that day in Solomon's day. And how does it look to you now? It seems now like nothing to you, doesn't it? The glory of this new house will surpass that of the old, says Adonai Tzvaot, the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will grant shalom. That was an amazing prophecy in Haggai. Chapter 2, considering the glory that we read about that appeared at the first temple dedication in Chronicles at the first temple. And now there's 120 similar amount Jewish believers present when God's spirit is poured out in an even more powerful way here in Acts chapter 2. Thereby fulfilling this prophecy from Haggai that we just read. And as a result of Peter's explanation that morning... Concerning the outpouring of the Spirit that he's preaching to the crowd there that had gathered. There was added that day, folks, this was a great day, 3,000 souls who were then immersed, by the way, verse 41 of this chapter 2. How many of you know the only place that this could have happened would be at the temple? The southern steps of the temple, when we go on tour, it's one of my favorite spots in Israel, could hold the size of this crowd of thousands. Nobody else in Jerusalem had a big enough house that could accommodate these thousands except God's house. The temple also had proper mikvaot, immersion pools, who could be used, which could be used for immersing the thousands that came to know Yeshua that day. So let's put it all together this morning. Yeshua dies at Passover season. It was 50 days later that the Holy Spirit's poured out in Acts chapter 2. In the prior chapter, in chapter 1 verse 3, we see Yeshua appeared to his followers during the first 40 of those 50 days. Why? Because Yeshua was preparing them for the great spiritual harvest that was about to come. That was going to parallel the physical harvest that they were bringing that was to come. And as the Torah commanded our Jewish people to count these 50 days for the promise of the physical harvest from Reshit Ketzerchem, the first of your harvest, the barley sheaves, to now Lechem Habikurim, the first fruits of bread, the wheat at Shavuot. Likewise, our Messiah Yeshua commanded his Shelechim, his emissaries, to wait in Jerusalem during the same 50-day counting period until they saw the promise, not of the physical harvest, but of the spiritual harvest brought about by the outpouring of the Spirit of God that was prophesied to take place. 50 days ago on the biblical calendar, we gathered. The earlier first fruits offering was given on the day of the resurrection of Yeshua. It pictures Messiah as our first fruits offering from the dead. We learned that 50 days ago. But this second first fruits offering, this is a far different picture, my friends, altogether. This offering is a picture of the believers in Messiah, his called out one. Acts chapter 2 shows how this happened when the feast of Shavuot had fully come. As followers of Yeshua today, you and I comprise a second first fruits offering to the Father. As Yeshua was that first fruits offering way back at the resurrection, so also we are a first fruits offering in his new creation, the body, of, as, if you will, of the Messiah. We are for God's use only. We've been stamped, set apart to him, totally dedicated to him, totally sold out to him. And along with the privileges of being God's first fruits also comes much responsibilities, right? As Yeshua said, to whom what? Much is given, much is required. We're expected to serve and to live in a way that God is honored in everything that we do. 
And as his followers, we are to present ourselves for God's use only. We experience his multitude of spiritual blessings as we do that, as we yield ourselves to the Lord, as we live for the Lord, as he begins to fulfill his purpose in us. During this counting period of 50 days, it appeared, as we see here in Acts 2, that Yeshua's followers had all but been scattered to the wind, right? We know that there were 500 witnesses that saw Yeshua between Passover and this day of Shavuot, but there's only 120 here present at the events in Acts chapter 2. Where were the rest of the 380? Well, they seemed again to be kind of just Encouraged and depressed, they scattered themselves. They had returned to their daily lives, no doubt. Their messianic hopes probably were dashed to pieces like pottery. And it had only been, guess what? Only been 10 days since they had last seen Yeshua. My friends, what do we take from this? I think a couple of thoughts. Number one, I believe God is doing the same thing today. He's giving us 50 days, so to speak. Our preparation time to be trained in prayer, to be trained in the word of God for the things that Yeshua spoke about concerning the last days. Listen, they were scattered after 10 days. They didn't see him. They were scattered. We're going to see some dark times on this earth. We have seen some dark times on this earth already. It's preparation time. We must continue on like these 120 did. How did they continue on? Unshakable. Number two, I believe that the day is coming soon. When the conditions are going to be ripe, which the fire was poured out, is going to be recreated. We're going to have a recreation event, I believe. The fire is again going to fall on Messianic Jews in Jerusalem, connected to the celebration of the biblical feasts. Now, if that expectation, and it's mine, if that expectation is shared in partnership by international believers of every tongue, tribe, and nation... I believe that it could be a catalyst for a mighty revival to break forth as written about by the prophet Joel and quoted by Peter here. That's my expectation. I believe we're getting ready for that. And number three, collectively, the followers of Yeshua, we are known actually as Kalat Moshiach, the bride of the Messiah. Presently, we're living in a betrothal period, as it were, which the bride and the groom were separated until the wedding day. Our responsibility during that time of separation is to be, again, faithful, unshakable, faithful to our heavenly bridegroom. When he returns, when Yeshua returns, we will finally, praise God, be united with him and the glorious wedding ceremony will take place. And money's not going to be an issue, is it, at that time to put on a wedding? So why do you think, as we close here, why do you think that God chose this festival to pour out his spirit? Well, we've seen it was a scriptural day of harvest, wasn't it? I'll say it was. 3,000 people, this is a pretty good day. 3,000 people accepted Yeshua and were immersed. Oh, man, you know, we get tired. We immerse 20, 30 people. 3,000 people were immersed. Interestingly enough, on the flip side, 3,000 idolaters of the golden calf were killed at Sinai. Number two was a scriptural day of first fruits as well. Now, some suggest that there's further significance to the first fruits offering at this time. Often, you'll see two loaves of grain being offered that they symbolize both Jews and Gentiles coming together in the unity of the Spirit to work together. That's what we're doing. That's what this whole conference is about today. Hand in hand, arm in arm for Yeshua until he returns. The first fruits of Shavuot is fulfilled in the Messiah. Quote, the Messiah has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have died. And we are the first fruits of the resurrection. His resurrection. In other words, we should exemplify the same kind of power and victory that Yeshua had. Jews and Gentiles brought together through the miracle of Shavuot. We share a common calling, don't we? To reach the world for Yeshua. Together, we have a common mission. I'm going to be sharing about this this afternoon. To bring the good news of Yeshua, the Messiah, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And finally, I think we can see that God chose to pour out His Spirit on this day 
because our Jewish people had been promised a spirit way back in the Torah. Numbers chapter 11, verse 29. Moses prayed that all would have the spirit of God upon them. But I believe God did us one better. You know, we read in the Tanakh, right, of certain people, King David, Moses, uh, Eldad and Medad, the Spirit of God would fall, would come upon them in power, certain individuals. But God did us one better here. He poured His Spirit out within us, all of us. It says, all began to speak with other tongues at this time. Paul says, quote, He anointed us, set His seal of ownership on us, and put His Ruach, His Spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Are you saying, this is a deposit. Just a deposit guaranteeing what's to come. That's why I believe we're going to see this recreation of Acts chapter part 2, as it were. This means that the Holy Spirit's a guarantee from God of our eternal destination. His presence with us, in us, on us, guarantees our being with Him for eternity. Paul likewise said this, quote, You receive the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. The Spirit's work in us leads him to work through us. God provides us with the full residence of this resource of the Spirit so that we might live fully in Him and live fully for Him. He doesn't put us to work without the resources, right, to accomplish His tasks. God doesn't necessarily call the qualified. He what? He qualifies the called. That's important. Chavarim, friends, how appropriate it is to be speaking of the presence of God on the Feast of Shavuot. The event of this day, nearly 2,000 years ago, stands as the picture of our goal, of the goal of our prayers for revival and for awakening. The true Shavuot. If I can get Vicky, maybe, I don't know, maybe she's with the kids. It shows us the elements here in Acts 2 of the atmosphere in which the Spirit of God freely abides. They were all equally before the Lord without any individual having the designation of being God's spokesman. The degree of their oneness went beyond agreement on issues. Let me tell you something. I've been honored to serve as the president of the Messianic Jewish Alliance of America. I'm ending a three-year term in less than 30 days. We, as Jews, we have a lot of opinions. It's hard to be unified at times. It's hard to bring agreement on issues. But this is what this festival is all about. Unity. Hinam atov umanayim. Shevet achim gam yachad. How good and how pleasant it is when brothers and sisters dwell together in unity. For therein God commands his blessing. They had come to a place of total acceptance of one another. Listen, as we gather over this afternoon at Faith Chapel, we're going to have First Nations. We're going to have the Hispanic community. We're going to have the Asian community. We're going to have the African American community. We're going to have representatives from the Messianic Jewish community. You know, it could be rife for a lot of, you know, hard feelings, maybe people feeling uplifted or put down. It's always in a group of hundreds of people like that. And Shavuot is all about the spirit of unity. They'd come to a place of total acceptance of one another. We have a lot of growing to do in that regard. I know I have a lot of growing to do in that regard. They were fulfilling the Great Commission. If you'd stand with me today. They were loving God. They were loving one another. And so with that condition in play in Acts 2, they were prepared now for His abiding presence. How much time we have spent praying for the presence of the Lord, fasting for the presence of the Lord to come? Is it that we want God to do something like heal the sick in our bodies or our families, raise the dead maybe, save the lost? How would we think or what would be our process if we simply desired God to come and just be with us? One thing is about doing, the other is about being.
to desire him for his love and for his beauty is so different, isn't it, from desiring him for what he can do. It's just so simple. When he comes, all the works, all the ways of the Spirit are made manifest. When the light shines, when he comes in this way, all darkness gets extinguished. May we be given discernment to know how to prepare a place that God cannot help but be attracted to. My goal every week is that God would want to hang out at Tree of Life every single Shabbat. We have to foster that for him to want to come in our hearts. My friends, when we remember the purity and fear of the Lord that the children of Israel found in themselves that day at Shavuot, at Mount Sinai, we find courage and we are assured that we don't need to be afraid in our lives to, to hear the voice of the Lord as they heard then. They were afraid. We don't need to be afraid to internalize His words to take them to the world in need around us. When we read about these emissaries here in the book of Acts, our hearts and minds dream about what it would be like to be there, right? To feel the Spirit there, to burn with testimony for God's kingdom in that generation. But let us take that spark of motivation and apply it to our actions every single day that remains in 2022. That's what Shavuot means. It's available to everyone. That's what God did us better. No longer is it just going to be on Eldad, Medad, King David, Moses, and Aaron. No, God poured it out on all of them. And they were never the same. And they turned Israel, they turned the Roman Empire upside down. Lord, could San Diego be turned upside down? Yes, it can. Lord, we want to be that righteous remnant here in San Diego that has a prophetic word for the people of San Diego. And as it goes forward today, at this conference, Lord, and it's picked up on podcasts and things going forward. God, we believe that you've called us to this assignment. To take the schism of 2,000 years between Jews and Gentiles, that enmity, and to break down that mechitza, that dividing wall that has separated us, that the devil has tried to capitalize on. That we would truly model the olive tree, wild branches, natural branches from all nations gathered in the olive tree together multinationally to worship the living God of Israel and God of the nations. Lord, what a high assignment. We know the devil has been fighting this assignment for nearly 2,000 years. We know that there are thousands of denominations that are fractured because one guy doesn't agree with the way they do baptism and so they form a new... And we've seen thousands of people separate. We see the races have separated. The devil wants to bring division in our country, bring ethnic and racial strife, but we have found him out. We have found the schemes and walls of the adversary and greater is he that's within us than he that's within the world. So Lord, let us be that conduit of blessing in our lives, whether we go to the grocery store, when we interact at the office, when we do good works for our neighbors. Lord God, we believe you've called us to be repairers of the breach in our society. So Lord, would you take the rest of this day and continue to equip us for this mission? It's an assignment. We need to be ready. We need to be prepared. Thank you for doing it. Thank you for pouring out your spirit in us. That when we walk up next to a dangerous situation, that means the Holy Spirit has walked up with us into that dangerous situation. Thank you, Lord, that when we don't know how to speak, that you will speak through us as the Holy Spirit gives us utterance. We will speak to kingdoms. We will speak to governments. We will not know ahead of time what to say, but the Holy Spirit will be moving in us, causing us to open our mouths that he would fill it. We thank you for the Godhead, fully God, the Holy Spirit. We have relegated him to some Casper the Friendly Ghost in our theology. He is God, the Holy Spirit. And he's moving today in hearts and in lives. And he's moving throughout this county. And he's moving throughout this planet as the planet wars there are no solutions to many of the earth's problems but the Lord God and His Spirit. 
So, Lord, we pray for our nation now. We pray for the families down in Uvalde and in Buffalo and in all of these places in Iowa, Lord God. We know that only Yeshua the Messiah can solve these problems. The yielding to his lordship in lives and in hearts is the solution to these problems. Sounds simplistic, but it's the truth. So, Lord, we ask that we would be able to look through the eyes of faith, the eyes of the Spirit, to be able to be that voice in our world, to call the world back to you. May a spirit of shuva, of shuva, of repentance, pervade this city, county, state, and country. Father, we need it. Our country is going the wrong direction. And Lord, only you would give us more time to share the good news of Messiah before the great day of the tribulation comes, these difficult times. Thank you, Lord, for doing it and for equipping us, little old us in your kingdom, for you use the foolish things of this world to confound the very elect. We bless you out of Zion today from San Diego. We wish each other a Chag Shavuot Sameach. It is traditional, by the way, as the word is read, it brings joy to our hearts. It brings happiness and sweetness. And so that's why we eat sweet dairy things, as you'll find out in the lobby. I believe some have brought some cheesecake or root beer floats. These foods help us to remember that honey and milk, the word of God, are even under our tongue. And so as God told Moses to tell Aaron and his sons how to bless the children of Israel in those days, likewise, this is God's prayer over us this day. May the Lord bless you and keep you today. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May Adonai lift up his countenance over you and grant you peace. In the name of the Prince of all peace, Yeshua HaMashiach of Nazareth, and all of us who are with him to the end would say, Amen. Amen. Chag Sameach, everybody. Join us outside for Kedush in a time of refreshments. Hope to see many of you over at Faith Chapel later today. Shalom, everybody.